Um, I just want to start off by thanking Emma and Richard for organising this day. I think it's absolutely fantastic and uh, also inviting me to speak. And I also want to thank all of you for coming along to this session as well. Um, I, I hope that it's useful uh, for you. And as, as I've just said to a couple of people, I'm very happy to share all of these resources uh, afterwards. Uh, if you would like to share them further on, that's absolutely fine. Um, the session is being recorded. So if you want to have your cameras off, that's absolutely fine. If at the end there's a few minutes to ask any questions, just be aware that if you unmute or, or put something on the chat, then it will be visible in the recording. So I just wanted to let you know that in case you prefer to opt out. Um, my name's Daniel Langley, um, and I currently work at Sir Henry Floyd Grammar School, which is the mixed grammar school in Aylesbury, and I'm the subject leader for drama and theatre. And I also work as an examiner for GCSE drama, and also as a specialist leader in education through the Astra Alliance. Um, and I've called this talk an introduction to educational research, because I think over the last couple of years, um, there's been really just an explosion of interest in research and evidence and, and using that in teaching. And I, I hope that I'm on safe ground in saying that most people now accept that using evidence and using research is a good thing. Um, it's certainly something which I found very useful. But, you know, there are lots of great sessions happening today, which are a testament to that. But the question is kind of how do we start? How do we get to grips with it? Uh, where do we begin? So what I'm hoping to do today is just give you some starting points, really, um, because there's so much out there. And my disclaimer is, of course, that I don't know everything. OK, <laughs> um, and, and please, I'm very, very open to challenge, very, very open to other points of view. All I know is that everything I'm presenting today has been useful to me. OK, and I think perhaps that's useful to share. And after this, hopefully you'll be able to, to go away. I can provide some starting points and you can find your own material and then let me know afterwards uh, what you did and, and, and how it was useful. I'd, I'd love to hear all about it. And really, that's the first key takeaway, I suppose, um, that I just want to highlight. And I'm going to um, put in these quotes. Uh, the first one's from Tom Sherrington, who's an ex-head teacher, now an advisor. You can follow him on Twitter at TeacherHead. He says, everything works somewhere and nothing works everywhere. And I think that's absolutely a, a brilliant way of thinking about it. If you've ever kind of moved schools and something that worked perfectly before kind of isn't working anymore in your new classes um, and something which works in one school, you try to put it in your own and it's just not happening. So you've got to find the things that work for you right now in your context for your students. And I think that's a really important mantra to go forward with. So when I was thinking about this presentation, I thought how to break it down. And ultimately, I thought I'd break it down into three sections. Uh, why should we engage with evidence and research? If we don't understand why we're doing it, um, I don't think that we'll ever stick with it. Um, so thinking about why we're doing it, uh, and then what should we do out of everything? And then how on earth are we gonna fit it in to our day with everything else uh, that we have to do? And it starts with a story, really. It starts with my why. So why did I get interested in this? Um, well, on my NQT year, I was teaching a play called War Horse. Okay? So I'm a drama teacher. And uh, this fabulous play, some of you may have seen it or you might recognise it from the brilliant puppets. It was on at the National Theatre a couple of years ago. Um, and I was teaching this. It's set in World War I in the trenches. And as part of the GCSE written paper, students have to write all about the design. So how would they design this play and come up with their own ideas? And I thought, just like I'd been taught on my PGCE, um, I know what I'll do. Uh, I need to make this really engaging because students will be really bored about uh, World War I and the trenches and things like that if they're not running around having fun and it's drama. So, of course, that's what makes a good drama lesson, isn't it? Just running around and, and smiling a lot. So what I'll do is I'll get them to make their own sets and um, that'll teach them all about how to do this. Um, so my wife and I were collecting cereal packets and toilet rolls and my colleagues were collecting glue sticks and scissors and I thought even better um, what we'll do is we'll, we'll sell this with fake money to the different groups and get them to compete and then pick the best kind of trench set and it'll be fantastic and um, it was and I remember sort of sitting back and thinking wow this is brilliant and the kids were running around and shouting at each other to do things quickly and sticking things together it was absolutely brilliant and they were they were fully engaged fully involved and I just remember sitting back and thinking you know I've, I've cracked it I've done it I even uh, remember feeling so smug with myself I just remember thinking I hope a member of, of SLT walk in right now um, because and see what's going on here because it looks great um, 
until the students actually had to answer an exam question. Um, and then I realized, I don't know if you've ever had this, you sort of read what they've written, you think, where on earth were you during my lesson? Were you even on the same planet? It just looks as if it was going so well, and now I'm reading your answers, and you've all done terribly. Um, there was no mention of lighting states or moon atmosphere. There was no contextual uh, points made in there. And so I asked the students what they remembered from the lesson. And of course, you know, they remembered lots. The fact which teams they were in and who won and running around and doing all of the exciting activities. Um, but they didn't really remember any knowledge. They didn't really remember any facts. And I realized later when I heard a talk by, by Mary Meyer that I'd just been focusing on what the students were doing not what they were learning. So I was just focusing on the task, not what I actually wanted them to learn. And I think sometimes that comes out of a fear that if students aren't kind of being really happy and laughing all the way through it, then they're not gonna learn anything. And I realize, and I love what Claire Stoneham says uh, about it. She said, avoid uh, novel at all costs because the kids will remember the novelty, not the knowledge. Now that's not to say things can't be fun, okay? It doesn't mean you have to stand at the front and, and be kind of grag grindian about it. But what it does mean is that you have to make sure that you're clear on what you want the students to learn. So this got me thinking about uh, how to move forward. And in my career as a drama teacher, I found if you talk to parents and colleagues, even teachers a lot of the time, people say things about drama, it's fun, it's creative, it's teamwork, um, very, hardly ever people say, oh, it's, a, it's great because you get to learn about theatre history or you get to learn about different theatrical styles. And, you know, is it any wonder when I think back to my PGCE, we spent a lot of time just talking about how to keep everybody on board, which is, of course, important, but we weren't really focusing on how to, how we weren't focused on teaching and learning. How do we get the students to actually learn the knowledge that we need them uh, to know? So uh, where to begin? I realized that some of the things that I'd learned and some of the things that I was doing, although they looked fantastic, they weren't having much of an impact, that there were kind of myths out there or kind of folk teaching or things that have been around for years, but actually don't really work very well. I wasn't really sure why I was doing it. So if you want to have a look at that literature, if you're not really sure if what you're doing uh, might now be considered kind of mythical, then you might want to have a look at some of the literature in the blue box. And it's partly informed by our increased understanding of how the brain works. I'm going to touch on that in a minute as well. And all of this literature I'll refer to, to again. But I just wanted to pick up on Seven Myths About Education by Daily Christodoumi, because this really turned everything on its head for me. She pinpoints things like I've just been talking about, things that we, 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 we've been around for years, we think it works brilliantly, um, established ideas, and she just shows that actually they're not very effective, or there are other things that we could be doing. So myth four, she says, well, you know, we don't need to worry about teaching facts because we can always just look it up. You know, Google exists and all kids have got phones, so it's all right, we can just be a guide at the side um, and we can just teach kids research skills and they'll just learn it all themselves. Fantastic job done. <laughs> um, now, I, I love Google, okay? I love Google. I think research skills are important. But Daisy Christodoulou points out the way that, um, she points to several flaws in, in all of this. And a lot of it goes back to ideas that are coming out now about working memory and long-term memory, which I'm gonna to touch on uh, just for a moment now. Um, <clears throat> some of you might have started to see things like this in school presentations or kind of pictures of brains with kind of arrows going in different directions. Um, some of you might have not, but the basic premise is that we kind of have a short memory at the front of our brains. It can handle about six or seven ideas. Okay, so hopefully, or probably I'm sort of using all of that up at the moment for you. Um, and if we repeat that long enough uh, and we do it enough times, then hopefully it will go back into here, into our long term memory, our long term library, and we can call on that whenever we want. And it's just about repetition. If we do it enough, then it can go back, deliberate practice. Um, and essentially, the reason why this is such a myth is because if we have those six or seven ideas in our short term memory, that's fine, but then we get overloaded. And if we don't have any knowledge in our long term memory, we have nothing to compare it to. So, yes, students can go away and they can find information. Um, but then how do they know whether it's right? How do they know whether it's correct? How do they know if it's accurate? If they've got absolutely nothing uh, to compare it to, if they have no previous knowledge. 
And that's why just looking it up on Google doesn't quite work. And uh, I want to just demonstrate this now through a quick exercise. Um, if you wouldn't mind, could you all just answer that sum? You don't have to call it out, just work it out. Okay, hopefully that's enough time. Um, it's 98, okay, well done for those who got it right. Um, don't worry if you didn't. For some of you, you might have just took one look at that and thought, I'm not doing that. It's not even 10 o'clock, I'm not doing that. Um, but if you're anything like me, you did 10 times seven, and then you did four times seven to get there, or you might have done sort of 12 sevens and then add 14 and added them up and, and you come to the answer. But whichever way you did it, you drew on existing knowledge at the back of your brain from that library. It's called your the times tables. So in order to work it out, you broke it down into sections and you use your times tables and then worked it out at the front of your mind in the working memory. Now, if you didn't have your times tables in your long-term memory, then what you'd have to do is kind of count it up seven bits at a time and work it out in sections and write it down and because your working memory can't process it all and keep hold of it. You probably would have forgotten the first part by the time you got to the second part. So you need to have that knowledge in your long-term memory to draw it forward in order to resolve current problems that you're trying to do in the moment. So looking things up on Google, 21st century skills, just have a look it up, just look it up on your phone. Yes, they can find the information, but is it accurate? How can they apply it? How can they fit it in what they already know if they don't know anything? So teaching knowledge is important. So if you want to learn more about how the brain works, I really uh, suggest that you have a look at Pex McRae, Memorable Teaching. Or well, Edie Hirsch has written loads about this, about why knowledge is important, how the brain works, how you can integrate things like retrieval practice, recalling knowledge to the front of our minds, making uh, teaching stick. And again, just to repeat, if you want to have a look at some of those myths, uh, then you can have a look at some of the literature on the left hand side. Um, so hopefully that convinces you why we should do it, because some things are more effective than others. Um, but where to to begin? Um, you know, you sometimes look on Twitter or you kind of see on Amazon, you know, lots of books, lots of different things, lots of people that everyone seems to be following. It's like this little secret club and you kind of want to get into it because you want to know what everyone's talking about. Um, and, you, you know, you sort of order a book and before you know it, it's on the bedside table and it's collecting dust. And this is certainly what I did. Um, and I realized that one of the problems that I face is just that there's so much out there. So it's really difficult to kind of decide sort of what to, to, to start with. And um, I came across a, uh, a talk by Dylan William, probably the most misspelt uh, teacher in education. Uh, it is just one L, um, but whenever you see him, people always kind of can't quite believe that. It took me a while to get used to it. Um, but Dylan William, uh, absolutely fantastic. He says, teachers have to stop doing good things in order to do things that are even better. And this really struck a chord with me because I think we're just so busy all of the time. You know, one of the things that we don't have is, 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 is time. Everyone's just so busy. And we're not very good at saying no to things because we want the best for our students. So we just say yes to everything because we just think it's a fantastic idea. But the problem is we just don't have time to do everything. So he says that, you know, pretty much every single thing that we do has value but some things have more value than others. So actually to be effective, what we really need to do is stop doing some of those things, to be brave enough as individuals to stop doing them and to have permission from our leaders uh, to, to, to stop doing them, not because they're not good, but because there are things that are even better that we could be doing. Um, <clears throat> so how do we do that? Well, I think that there are a couple of different ways. Okay, so I've broken this down into three different sections that you can go and have a look at. Um, in the blue box, there are kind of evidence reviews that have been done by um, organisations like the Evidence Based Education and the EEF, um, who luckily have gone away and they've looked through everything for us and they've kind of summed everything up in succinct documents. And we can have a look through that and look at the best of what's been, been said and, and talked about. And we can take that and we can try and apply it in our own school so you know when you last did a kind of your own kind of academic writing you will have done a literature review trying to establish what the current state of play already is and that's uh, what, how an evidence review can be used and then you might want to look at things that are the least effective here's the controversial part um, okay so some people like to point out the things that maybe we should stop 
stop doing or, or, or maybe do less of. Um, and there's a great article, you can find it on Twitter, 10 Low Impact Activities by Tom Shonton. So if you want to check uh, whether or not you're, you're doing those and perhaps reconsider, you could have a look at some of that literature. And then there's kind of the ready-made approaches. So some of you might just want to kind of, you know, I just want to pick something up. I want to look at it for five minutes over my coffee in the staff room. And I just want to be able to walk into my classroom and I just want to do it. And those ready-made approaches like Teach Like a Champion or a brilliant book called Making Every Lesson Count uh, is an absolutely fantastic way of, of doing that. Um, so I'll just pull out a couple of examples from these and, and why they're so good and, and, and how you could use them. Just going to have a quick look on the uh, chat in case there's a, a problem. Yes, um, all these slides will be will be shared, and I believe that Emma's going to put the recordings and she's going to put the slides uh, on the website. So no need to kind of scribble down uh, all the way uh, out. And I'm very uh, happy to share everything as well. No worries. Okay, so. Um, First of all, evidence reviews. This one made a splash uh, about a week or so ago now. Um, absolutely fantastic, great teaching toolkit, pulling together different uh, reviews of, of, of evidence. And they split it into, into four nice, neat sections. Um, so you could start by having a look through that. Um, section three is all about establishing behavior, routine, classroom management, um, might be useful after COVID. When we're starting to thinking about going back in and re-establishing routines, starting to re-establish kind of day-to-day -day working on site with more pupils, having a look at section three of the evidence review kind of sums up different ways uh, that you might um, establish those routines again in, in September, if that's something that you are interested in. Um, but, you know, anything to do with curriculum, teaching and learning the sort of um, neuroscience, how the brain works, as we were talking about before, is all contained in, in four nice sections, take you about an hour to read, something like that, and then you can pick and choose and perhaps it'll take you down uh, through the labyrinth and you can find your own path to what is useful. Okay, the least effective. Um, Again, some of this stuff you know, is not going to be accepted by everybody. <laughs> I think that's partly the point. Some of the things we've been doing for years and years and years in schools, it's very hard to stop doing them. Very hard to go, Ooh, actually, I don't really want to believe the evidence um, that says this isn't very impactful. And I just reiterate again what Dylan Williams says. He says it's not that they're, they're not useful. It's just that there are things that are more useful than others. And we, we don't have time to do everything. Um, and one of the things that Tom Shonton and Dylan William talk about is um, observations and grading teachers. And I think this is you know, often a kind of controversial area because everyone's trying to do their best. And it's really, really hard when someone comes in and, and, and observes you, if it's a judgmental uh, observation uh, particularly. And Dylan William kind of, you know, he just points some flaws out in this. He says, you know, if learning is changes to long-term memory, so if it's committing things to that long-term library, as we said before, then in an observation, what you're actually doing is you're trying to judge if what's happening in front of you right now is going to have a long-term impact in six weeks time. As we actually can't do that, that's actually incredibly difficult to do. Now, of course, if the students are climbing the walls and throwing things across the classroom, sure, okay, <laughs> there needs to be some intervention. But actually, it's very difficult to judge whether if everyone's engaged in using that working memory, whether or not that's actually going to go into the long term memory or not. And research evidence is now starting to show that we're actually quite bad at pointing this out. Um, Dylan William points to a study where there were two groups of teachers. Okay, and the, in the first group, it didn't matter where those teachers had taught in affluent areas, in deprived areas, um, higher, high previously attaining students, they always managed uh, to, to teach their classes and achieve above average progress for their students. And again, another group of teachers, uh, group B, whatever they did, whoever they taught, wherever they taught, um, even if it was in the best school with the best pupils in the most affluent areas, um, the, the pupils always made below average progress uh, based on, on, on their kind of group. So they kind of established these two groups, good teachers, bad teachers, and they filmed them teaching. They mixed all the videos up, then they showed them to teachers and leaders, they showed them to governors and parents, and also primary school kids, and said, right, sort it out into good teachers and bad teachers. Tell me which are the good lessons and which are the bad lessons. And the teachers and the leaders did this with a 37% accuracy. So they were accurate just 37% of the time. The primary school children 
uh, were more accurate. They were accurate 49% of the time. And Dylan Williams said, well, why is this? Is it because primary school kids know when they're being taught well and when they're not? Mm, well, yeah, maybe they have a hunch, but actually it's probably just because they guessed. And if you think that that sounds unbelievable, just consider for a moment the fact that if teachers and leaders can only identify good teachers from bad in 37% of cases, then you're more likely to accurately grade teachers by flipping a coin than you are conducting an observation. Well, now I hide. <laughs> but, you know, of course, observations can have some use, but really, is it the best use of time, particularly if we're doing it all the time? Or can you move to a culture that's more about sharing practice, I wonder, rather than being very, very judgmental? Does it actually work, particularly if you're working in a school full of good and outstanding teachers? OK, whew, made it through that bit. OK, ready made approaches. Teach like a champion and um, quick, easy takeaway techniques. And I love this one that um, <clears throat> I'm going to use an example is a technique called no opt out, um, which is all about questioning. No opt out. You ask student A a question. OK, and they say, oh, I don't know the answer. You say, OK, right, I'll go to student B. Can you please give me the answer? And they give you the correct answer. You say fine and you will move on. Apart from student A just completely opted out and got away with it and learns that if I don't answer the question, that's all right. Um, with no opt out, and again, you can see this, but the book comes with a DVD, so you can watch people doing this. It's fantastic. And it just explains it over two pages. So it's really quite sort of quick and easy to get hold of. You can, you can read it and just immediately go in and do it. So with no opt out, you ask student A the question and they say, hmm, I don't know. And then you ask it to student B, they give you the correct answer. And importantly, you go back to student A and you say, so give me the correct answer then. And they often go, what? No, sorry, I wasn't listening. That's because they've already opted out. They got away with it. So, so you go back to student B, you say, right, repeat the answer again, please. They repeat it. You go back to student A, you say, can you please just give me the correct answer? And then they repeat it. And when you first do this, all the students kind of look at you like, you know, it's really weird. Um, someone just gave the correct answer. Why are you just making me repeat it? What's the point? And, you know, to an extent, they're right. Just repeating something isn't going to necessarily make them learn it. But what it does is create a culture where students realize that whatever happens, they are going to have to answer the question. There is no opt out. So when they're sitting there, they feel that they might be called upon at any time to answer a question. And if they don't know it, they're going to have to answer it in the end anyway. And it, the first time you do it, it just makes everyone just kind of sit up a bit and pay attention. Everyone's just a little bit more focused than they were before. And it just ensures that everyone's really listening to what everybody else is saying, because they know that they're just not going to get away with it. So to watch the videos and read about like that in Teach Like a Champion probably takes less than 10 minutes. Um, so if you want something where you can just pick it up, look at some techniques very, very quickly, get in the classroom, start doing it, um, then I really suggest these ready-made approaches. Okay, so evidence reviews, things that you can look at yourself, uh, a kind of review of everything that's been said, perhaps considering some of the things that you could let go of or just stop doing or just do a little bit less. Um, or perhaps you just want to do a ready-made approach. You just want to get going and get in the classroom. So perhaps, you know, that gives you some starting points of, of what are the sorts of things uh, that you want to do. Right. Are we still are we still there? We're doing all right for time. That's excellent. Um, <clears throat> so the last part is how on earth are we going to do this? <laughs> so kind of convinced uh, the why is 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 there, and uh, we we know what we're going to do. Uh, but how on earth are we going to do this? And I think first of all, it just comes down to the reason why you want to do it. And um, and for me, it's just the idea that. Um, you know, we spend so much time uh, in our jobs. You know, teachers are so committed, despite what the media say. We're so committed. Um, and it just, just the idea that, you know, all of that time uh, spent in the classroom, that's a lot of what I might be doing might not be that effective. You know, even if it feels like it, a lot of what I'm doing might not actually be working that well. And, you know, when we're giving up our own time and working into the evenings and, and not spending time with our families, just the idea that, you know, actually, you know, the, the point of doing that might be lost. Um, I, I, you know, I just can't, I can't live with that, particularly when there are, are books which we can easily pick up and just tell us what to do. So that's what drives me to look at this stuff. I want to make sure that what I'm doing in the classroom is having the biggest impact in the time that I have. Um, so how can we then start on that journey? 
Well, collectively, we've got the knowledge, but we just have to realise it's up to us to share it. And that's what's so great about what Emma's done with this conference today. We, as a profession, actually have a lot of this knowledge. We just have to get better at sharing it. And some people are doing that already. Um, and it's great when people attend and, and share their knowledge because, you know, as a profession, um, we are so knowledgeable. We just have to get better at recognising that we are. Um, OK, so how? Well, I think there are things that you can do as an individual. And I think there are things that you can do as, as a whole school as well. So as an individual, I think that there are different grassroots organisations that you can get involved with. And by grassroots, I mean these are set up by teachers for teachers who want to engage with evidence and engage with research, like the Charter College of Teaching, like Research Ed, and like BrewEd. And I'm going to talk about those a bit more in a minute. And then the last thing I'm going to talk about is just how you might um, implement this into to a whole school approach. Just talk a little bit about how that's happened at, at my school over the past two years. Um, so as an individual, there are these grassroots organisations and the Charter College of Teaching is a fantastic uh, body of people who get together and they created a website called My College. Once you have membership and you do have to pay for it, okay, it's, I think it's about £50 as an individual, um, they put together collections of evidence, a bit like I was saying before, in distinct folders, COVID-19, student behaviour, SEND, retrieval practice, they do all the work for you, so you have access to that all of the time. They also create the impact journal and there's an image of that on the on the right hand side of your screen now and this is a kind of well-respected journal um, of teachers and educators who write about how they've implemented uh, implemented research in their classrooms but i have to say it's a little bit more accessible i'm not i, I wouldn't dismiss it as a magazine it's, it's very very academic but you know it's nicely laid out it, it feels like it can be on the coffee table you don't have to kind of clear an afternoon to kind of get your head around um, something insanely complicated. It, it is very accessible and that gets sent to you every term or so. Um, Research Ed is a fantastic grassroots organisation which uh, organises conferences um, which you can go to and just recently during the lockdown they've done some brilliant videos on YouTube so if you put into YouTube Research Ed at home there's lots of people doing lots of fantastic talks on there and BrewEd as well exactly what it says on the tin meeting up over teas and coffees in your local area to discuss evidence and research. Now this is not without its criticism this is all great but you know a lot of people will say things like well I, you know I can't go to London on a Saturday to sit through a conference and you know that's that's so valid um, but I think that it's not an, an argument um, or a discussion that we should shy away from because years ago these organisations didn't even exist. Now they do exist and I think in the future if we really want staff and individuals to be able to engage with all of this then perhaps a discussion needs to take place about well you know if it's happening in the middle of the day on a Wednesday how can we let staff go and do that. And there are conversations around sort of flexible working and releasing people to actually engage with this stuff. So I don't think that it's something that we should shy away from. I think it's a, I think it's a discussion really, really worth having. Um, and now I just want to touch very briefly on, on a case study um, at my school, so Henry Floyd Grammar School, and our deputy head, Sam Holdsworth, who came in and, and was really, really kind of pushing um, and very, very interested in, in evidence, um, but realised a little bit like I was just saying that perhaps we need to approach things a little bit differently to actually let people do this. Um, so what he suggested was, let's take two of the uh, inset days and let's break them down okay, into 10 hours of twilights, A to J. But the important thing was, he said, you can do these hours whenever you want. Just let me know and just checked in, okay? But you can do them whenever you want. We're not going to put them on the whole school calendar. So straight away, all the staff have ownership about when they're going to do some of this engagement. They can do it before school, they can do it after school. If everyone's busy, they can just delay it. Okay, the people can do it when they want, as long as they do the 10 hours over the year. And then also splitting it down into different pathways. So all staff members have to pick a pathway. And the first pathway was all about research groups and journal clubs. So, you know, in your first hour, identify what you're all interested in. In the second hour, um, you know, uh, do, do the reading, then have a discussion about it, then apply it and pick something that you're interested in, a problem that is actually uh, evident in your classrooms, rather than just having an inset session where someone comes at the front, says a load of stuff to everyone, everyone goes off, has a cup of tea uh, on the inset day and pretty much forgets immediately what's been said. Again, I'm generalising there, of course, but you know what I mean. 
those things that come in and disappear year after year and on and on we go. But this actually gives staff ownership of it. And this, this has been really amazing uh, at our school. There was another uh, uh, pathway to do with coaching, not, you know, not strictly to do with evidence, but in terms of coaching, in terms of how they're applying teaching and learning evidence and research. And then also um, supporting staff to do qualifications like the MPQ ML or SL, or perhaps becoming uh, a chartered teacher or even doing something like an MA, all of which engage with research. So people could choose one of these pathways and then they could engage with it and do it uh, when they wanted. So it gave staff ownership and actually understood, and this is why I think it's worked so well, that if you want people to do it, then you actually have to change the system a little bit to give people time to actually do it well, because teachers do want to do it well. Sometimes though, it's just difficult to do so. So how as, as leaders and teachers and leaders of the future can we change it to make it more accessible? Okay, so things we can do as individuals and things that we can do as schools. Um, so why should we do it? It's because we want the best outcomes for the students and we want to do the things that are most effective. Uh, what should we do? Well, it depends what the issues are in our school right now, but we don't need to read every single book before we can figure out what those are. Some people have already done that for us. So if we look at a review, then we can pinpoint immediately what it is that we need to look at and we can find it and we can apply it straight away because we want to use our time effectively. And how do we do it? Well, as individuals, we can start to engage with it. We can watch it on YouTube. We can watch people presenting. We can read it ourselves. And hopefully we can start to move towards a culture where it's embedded within the school approach and hopefully we can start to mold and change to become more flexible to allow people to engage uh, with it a little bit more. So whew, there we go. Whistle stop tour um, of uh, educational research, um, getting to grips with the basics. And I hope that just provides uh, a few more thoughts, a few more ideas uh, that you can go away and, and have a look at. Um, these slides and this recording will be shared um, afterwards if you want to go uh, after it. And I can see a question that's come in and there are a few minutes to, to take some questions. Um, so you can either type them in the chat or, or unmute, that's, that's absolutely fine. But I also won't be offended if you want to quickly get out to get a cup of tea uh, before the next session, that's absolutely fine. I'll just say thank you now uh, to everyone for, for coming. Um, so the Charter College of Teaching, I think it's £50 for an individual membership and you do have to pay that every year. Um, so it's not cheap, but you, your school can do a school package which makes it cheaper um, for everybody. Um, but as an individual, um, I think it's probably one of the best things uh, that you can do um, if you want to, to, to engage with it. But you know, it is, it is £50, but it's the way that they, they, they fund it. But it's, it's very, very worthwhile. 